Adam is a classic role-playing game set in post-World War III Russia. If you've seen or heard a bit about the game, your first assumption is, hey, this looks like Russian Fallout. And I'm really not a fan of describing games by saying one is like another, but to be fair, the developers themselves have said they're clearly inspired by the classic Fallouts, and you can see that by how much it plays like them as well. So if you're into Fallout 1 and 2, and even Wasteland 2, there's a good chance you'll like this game. But if you haven't played those before, or you weren't a fan, then this might not be the game for you, but we still have a lot more to talk about, so let's get into it. Like so many other CRPGs, this game is post-World War 3, post-apocalyptic, you're in a wasteland, the Cold War went hot. But unlike others, this isn't a futuristic take. The backstory for the game felt quite authentic and convincing. World War 3 started in 1986, and the game takes place in 2005, and this ends up making for a really interesting setting. The world is in shambles, but there's a lot of people that survived from even before the war started. And so the wastelands are mixed of regular people that knew what used to be, mixed with crazy and evil and mental people that had been set free by the apocalypse. And it ends up making the world you explore feel much more down to earth and convincing. The plot itself is pretty straightforward. You're a operative of a secret government organization known as Atom, with their main focus now being recovering pre-war technology and restoring the wasteland to the pre-war Soviet society it was. Your mission is to investigate the disappearance of a General Morozov, an Atom leader which led an expedition to find a secret research bunker but went missing, and then the plot progresses from there on. We'll discuss more of the plot later, but now let's talk about the game's mechanics. If you've ever played any type of classic role-playing game, this screen should feel very familiar to you. For characteristics, instead of special, you have said Ipul. You have most of the same skills here. Stealth in this game is actually passive, and it's very confusing to how it works. It doesn't feel that useful. And tinkering is for crafting, which is a feature in this game. Personally, I'm not a big fan of really annoying crafting systems in games, but in this, it is pretty useful, but not necessary, and that's how I like it. You have Distinction, which is similar to Traits. They're permanent decisions which can positively and negatively affect your characteristics and skills. The main difference is that instead of perks, there is a skill tree. And there's a really good chance that you've played the game but didn't know this was actually a feature. They don't really tell you about it. It's a fairly in-depth tree which helps you specialize your character and companions. Every time you level up, you get two points, but every time you purchase a skill, it goes up in cost by one. So you really have to spend your points wisely, and it doesn't seem like there's any way to respec in-game. If you're new to the game, I recommend not actually touching the tree for your first few levels. It's definitely better to get a feel for the game, save up some points, and actually spend them when you know how you want to build your character. Are they going to focus on fully automatic guns, or are they going to be a melee tank, or are they going to be fully diplomatic? Otherwise, you'll be pretty likely to waste points. The game is in 3D, but handles like most other classic role-playing games. You move the screen with WASD and your mouse, and you interact with everything through your mouse buttons. You can freely move around in real time until it comes down to combat, which is turn-based, which uses a initiative and action point system. The combat system itself is very simple to understand, but it is fairly difficult. This really isn't a game that you can just plow through. It's unfair, that's really the best way to explain it, even more so than the classic fallouts. This game is harsh, and it never gives you a break. You get mugged at the start of a game, and you're left to wander around with nothing at all. Even bugs are a threat to your character at the start. And that's mainly because you're not some chosen one superhero. You are a part of this secret organization, but you got sent because you're competent, not because you're some amazing individual. The wastelands are filled with mutated monsters and evil slavers, and starting off, you're just one person. Sure, by the end of a game, you can be a killing machine and you and your whole squad can be kitted out with military gear, but if you're not a fan of the idea of starting from nothing and slowly grinding up and overcoming different odds, this may be the largest hurdle preventing you from fully enjoying the game. But the feeling of progression you get 
as you do improve is amazing going from someone with nothing at all to some amazing armor a good gun and a good squad is truly rewarding as you progress better gear will be available to loot and purchase the game has scalable difficulty for random encounters while the various bunkers and boss fights in the game will be the same regardless if you're level 1 or 30 Random encounters with slavers and bandits and various other enemies become more and more difficult on average. But fortunately, the game isn't just about combat. If you're a fan of dialogue skill checks, you're going to have a great time with this game. The best thing is you don't have to only be the charisma and speech type character to benefit from these opportunities. There's a really good variety of intellect, strength, attention, and even luck to resolve situations. And this is great because it stops your certain build from feeling useless in a situation. Sometimes it is objectively better to talk your way out of a situation or fight, but it's good that you always have the choice. And on top of skill checks, there's just a lot of talking that can be done in this game. There is a lot of amazing side quests to experience, but the conversations that you can have with random characters is great. It does a perfect job with immersing you in this Soviet culture that we don't usually get to experience in games. In other games, I felt myself often just skipping over non-essential dialogue. But in this game, I read everything I can, even the various rumours which don't actually relate to the game, just because it did such a great job of world building. It's usually just funny stories, but there is other significant stuff you can hear as well. People talk a lot about large and faraway cities that you can't get to, but I really hope we can in a later game or maybe even an expansion. And there's also often a lot of talk about local folklore, whether that's the mysterious skinworm or the infamous killer Kostya the Yob. And the great writing isn't just for small talk. This game's highlight is definitely the variety of side quests you can experience. I don't want to go too in depth because some of these are pretty easy to spoil, but just things like rebuilding the Red Fighter Village, helping Dan's ruthless bandits become a legitimate police force, hunting down the infamous death gang, and finding out what's behind this door. There's not a insane amount of locations in the game, but they are densely packed with things to do. You can spend a few hours helping out one town, and then you get a mission to go to another, where you can pick up some more. Even missions which were essentially fetch quests didn't feel very bad, because the game does a great job of interjoining areas. I never once stopped playing the game out of boredom. If you get sick and tired of hunting slavers and conspiracy theorists, you can go do some diplomatic work with the Chamber of Commerce. My first playthrough lasted for 35 hours, and that was pretty much doing the majority of quests that I accepted. You could probably finish the game in 20 hours if you focused on just the main quest line and on gathering good gear, but you could also stretch the game out to probably even 60 hours if you do every single quest. But that is partly because things do take longer than they should sometimes. A lot of missions are fairly vague, and it does get irritating over time. This can vary from mistranslated names so you're not sure who to talk to, from the journal sometimes just not updating and you're not sure if it's bugged or because you forgot to talk to a certain character or forgot a certain item. And I feel a lot of a game's issues are because it aims to emulate Fallout so strongly. Fallout 2 is great, but it's obviously dated, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but you can obviously see the technological limitations of the time. The inventory and trade system is a bit of a mess. The combat system isn't bad by any measure, but it's nothing new either. These are things I didn't have much of an issue with, but I need to point them out because I know they will dissuade a lot of people from playing. The game's biggest issue at the moment though is its pathfinding. Very early on, I noticed it. And at first I didn't mind because it didn't affect me or my companions. But later on in the game there is a lot of enclosed small areas and that seems like when the game freaks out. When you're in combat and you objectively know that there is space around your character for your companions to move around. Yet they run away or run around on the spot trying to find another way to get to the enemy. But it's infuriating because you can see the squares next to you which they could move through. So many hours were wasted on dying and reloading saves because my companions refused to attack the enemy. And when your companions could find another way through, they'd often run through a corridor or a door and trigger another combat scene. 
when the pathfinding isn't bugging out, AI is actually pretty good at combat. Enemies will hide when they know they're in danger and outgunned or when they run out of ammo. They'll often target the closest to death character and they use grenades pretty optimally. It makes for a pretty challenging experience even when you're well prepared. One issue though is there's a massive difference between melee and guns. Melee is useful at the start of a game. You don't have a gun and you don't have ammo. But as you progress more and more through the game, it's clear how powerful guns are. Stuff like the VSS and the RPK can take down even the toughest of characters in one turn. Not to mention being able to do this from a distance. The developers are working on improving melee, but as of the time of this review, if you're a combat character, you're gonna have to spec into any type of a guns eventually. One final issue with the combat is that often a lot of NPCs don't get counted in it. The actual combat zone is really small, and usually this is beneficial being able to pick off and drag away one enemy at a time, but it also affects your companions as well. And it's infuriating because sometimes it's at a really confusing distance. Your companion might be near you, but they're not near the enemy, or they might be stuck on a staircase or something. So once again, their pathfinding may have messed up. And you can issue your team commands, whether to be aggressive, avoid, or be defensive, uh, who to attack, where to go. And it doesn't always work. An issue is you can only issue it during your turn. So it is pretty limited. I'm just going to go ahead and say that I would much prefer if you could control all your companions. I know it's not really a classic Fallout thing to do, but as much as I love Fallout, this game would benefit from trying to be itself a bit more. Its story and setting and aesthetic is great, and in some ways I prefer it to Fallout, but trying to emulate a lot of really old mechanics kind of sabotages the game in some ways. Even with a small crowdfunded budget and a relatively small team, this game is still amazing, but there is a lot of occasions where you see a certain mechanic and think, yeah, this was cool back in 1997 when Fallout came out, but I wish they did more to improve on these mechanics rather than just recreate them. Stuff like the journal and inventory system are obvious examples for this. Now that we understand the basic mechanics of the game, the pros and cons, I'm going to give some tips, mainly because the game is still pretty new. Any game that's older than a few months, you can Google anything about it. But for a lot of people, they're going to be lost and confused playing this. I did have a lot of fun playing this game blind, learning all the things as I went along, but there were some occasions when I needed help as well. You can manually heal companions by equipping food and medicine and using it on them. Left control highlights NPCs and left alt highlights nearby items and objects. You can buy a car from Paragon or you can get a free one from the scrapyard. There is a total of five potential companions in the game, although you can only have four at a time. Fidel is the easy one, you find him in Krasno Many during the main quest, you can find one at Red Fighter, you can find another after rebuilding Red Fighter, there's the cool dog which you find in a random encounter, and there's also a girl outside of Paragon, but she's kinda weird. You know, you kinda look like my dad, maybe I should cut you up just for fun. You'll always want to keep a knife or an axe on you to harvest from animals, and when you're in Otrudoin, be sure to talk to the fishermen about collecting bug parts and about fishing in general. For most buying and selling, I recommend sticking to caravans as they have the best stock and prices. The armor and gun sellers in Krasnomene have pretty bad prices unless you've got some good barter. The game also has some pretty high speech checks, going up to even 140 sometimes, so be sure to keep your fedora, cologne, and weed with you. If you want to make a good melee character, be sure to check out the various skill trees. Getting damage resistances and having no penalty for armor is a lifesaver. Rather than dying instantly, you can absorb multiple shots from multiple people while your team picks some of them off with their guns. There's currently no downside to killing travelers and scavengers you come across to take their loot, Although I warn you of killing caravans as they will send some real tough mercs after you. The game also has four characteristic buffs that you can find. Three of these you can use on anything and one of them is just for luck. Two are in the Roaring Forest, one is in Dead City and another is from Fishing. And finally, give the crafting system a try. Early on it's very useful to get your first gun, your first set of armor, turn raw meat into corn meat and make a backpack. 
but as you get more blueprints and get more materials, you can still make some pretty powerful guns late game. Before we discuss the rest of the plot, there's something pretty funny I gotta address. With this being a Kickstarter game, there were certain tiers where fans could put certain things in the game, and this included character portraits and graffiti. And this resulted in some pretty surreal experiences. Whilst exploring the wastes, the last people I expected to come across were Reviewbra and Jay from Red Letter Media. The more and more I played, I noticed that certain characters had portraits of slightly edited celebrities or internet people. It's fairly odd and funny. I just hope they don't get any legal troubles with this, but it is the kind of stuff you can expect from a Russian game. There's even a million dollar extreme reference and various pop culture references in graffiti once again. This was all chosen by fans and backers, but I think the devs have their own sense of edgy humor as well because there's not many games that parody the 14 words, but I guess there is one now. I, I found all of this pretty funny, just an observation. I really hope the devs don't get in trouble. Okay, so now it's time to talk about and analyze the main storyline and ending. If you don't want spoilers, get out of here. Nah, just go to this time. So you're dropped into the wastes all by yourself. All you know is you need to find this General Morozov. Your two leads are to go to Krasnomene and meet Fidel, who is your partner to work with, and go to Bunker 317. Now, you can do either of these in the order that you want, but I think it is better to go see Fidel first. After meeting with Fidel, you can head to Bunker 317, which is on the northeast of the map. After arriving, you can enter the bunker for using explosives on this cart, or you can talk to the nearby explorers. And if you played this far, you know how this goes down. These guys want to check out the bunker, but they don't want to go on themselves, so they'll send you in. But obviously, this being a post-apocalyptic wasteland, they're gonna mug you as soon as you get out. So I really guarantee coming here when you can actually kill these guys because otherwise you're going to lose most of your gear. You can hide it in a locker after completing the bunker, but if you hide too much, they attack you anyways. Just another tip because I didn't enjoy this either. It wasn't very fun. It's very annoying. I don't like when games pull this on you. Now, there's not actually too much inside the bunker. You notice dead rodents starting off and you get to explore it. This game has a lot of notes you can read from dead scientists and explorers, and it does fill in the pieces really well. But as you progress getting to the end of the lab, you notice a whole bunch of dead Atom members. And near their dead bodies is a Mycelium medallion, which is the symbol of the mushroom cult. Fidel recommends going back to Krasnomene to check out the cult which resides there. But if you're extra observant, you'll notice that one of the bookcases has been moved. Grabbing a book you found earlier in the lab opens a secret compartment, revealing some kind of incubator or storage which has been broken open, and something has been taken or escaped from there. You then proceed to head back to Krasnomene, where you have two options. Pay Fidel's informer 10,000 rubles to learn about what the mushroom cult is up to, or do a bunch of missions for them. Now, at this point in the game, if you're fairly new, 10,000 rubles is a lot, so you might have to do all the cult shenanigans. It's nothing too evil, just mostly being really annoying, and you also kill a pig. Regardless of the choice that you pick, you learn that the mushroom cult is interested in two research bunkers far away, on the island of Dead City off the southern coast, and far to the west in the mountain ranges, known as the Mountain Pass of Woes. You can pick these in either order, but you learn very similar things. Both contain secret pre-war science bunkers, so there's a lot to learn about certain experiments and projects. I went to the mountain pass bunker first, and here's what I learned. It starts simply with agricultural experiments attempting to make crops grow better underground. This results in some mutations. Whilst this is happening, there is another experiment attempting to make a soldier which doesn't require food, water, sleep and can fight regardless of any temperature or attitude. They have some minor success, but these creations expire after a day or two. Project Mycelium was dedicated to learning about this fungal biomass which was a mutation of the experimented crops. Later on they decide to introduce various plant and animal tissues to create a better super soldier. The mutated fungus happened to be one of them 
Shortly later, the lab falls into chaos. Whilst in the Dead City bunker, you learn that the Mycelium project was appropriated after the new findings to attempt to make a organic AI, a fungal biomass. At the end of each bunker, there is a Atom Squad, the same organization that you work for that you were sent by to investigate General Morozov. Except they're not normal anymore. They're all guarding this fungal biomass that you just learnt about, and they inform you that they work for Mycelium, despite being Atom members. It's revealed that Mycelium has infiltrated the higher ranks of Atom, and it's evident that this biomass is sentient in a way, as it can clearly control and influence people's minds. You have to choose between letting them take the fungal mass back to the mycelium base in Krasnomene or killing them, but they say you don't really know the bigger picture and that this is for the good of all humanity, so you can trust them, right? Whether you kill them or let them pass, I won't judge you for letting them pass. They are really tough, but either way, you still make your way back to Krasnomene and head outside of a mycelium base. Outside of a mycelium base is an atom team who learned about the mycelium plot and a purge has begun to remove the compromised atom members. They also want to take over the city for a new base of operations. Now, despite there being a lot of them and all of them having pretty good guns and them disliking mycelium, they won't come with you into the underground to face whatever's happening. You don't even get a skill check to try. In a game which was pretty consistent with the choices that you could make, this one is pretty illogical. So you head underneath a mycelium building and are met by a group saying they won't let you progress because you might interrupt the sacrament of unity. With some really high skill checks or just a lot of explosives, you make your way past deeper below where this comes to an end. And there is General Morozov. Turns out during his expedition, he learned about this fungal biomass and decided to use it to try to save the world. His argument is that he can use this fungal biomass to create a hive mind and force humanity to work together. Why you may ask? Because between 30 to 130 years from now, a really large asteroid is going to hit the earth and kill 95% of the population. Now personally, this seems like a pretty unconvincing argument given we don't know if we can believe him and if the asteroid will actually hit the Earth and if it will be that bad. And honestly, it just feels like a not as good recreation of Fallout 1's ending. They even call it Unity. So honestly, not the greatest ending. If you join the Mycelium cult, then they forcefully hijack everyone's brains and uh, dickheads and it never actually says if they save the earth or you can just kill them or convince him to give up he gives up really easy if you're smart and he just walks away and then the game ends with a fallout type slideshow showing you the consequences of your choices and that's why i preferred the game's side quest to the main quest it wasn't bad but kind of uneventful and unconvincing but overall, I still thoroughly enjoyed this game, and given I only played about 4 new games this year, it's probably my game of the year. If you're a fan of classic role-playing games, you're most likely going to have fun with this. But if you aren't, you're probably going to have trouble with the two decade old mechanics that are still being used. I feel the game would have been even better received if it tried less to recreate Fallout. I am a big fan of Fallout 1 and 2, but for every good thing this game has in common with the classic Fallouts, it has the common negatives as well. Your journal is vague, inventory and trade isn't very intuitive, the game does encourage min-maxing and pretty much every issue can be solved by save scumming. I think the devs did a great job with their first game and such a small team and budget, but at the end of the day, too many people are just gonna remember Atom as Russian or Soviet Fallout. And while I actually prefer the Russian aesthetic and setting and folklore, it needed something a little more to feel unique. Classic role-playing games as a whole have become popular again, but to avoid fading into obscurity again, they need to do more to attract a new audience. The main issue is that there's not much appeal to this game if you weren't already a fan of other CRPGs. And while I consider a lot of the game's flaws minor for me as I am a fan of CRPGs, you need to think from the perspective of an average consumer. Old, clunky and unintuitive mechanics might not be an issue to experienced players, but it's not appealing to people that might want to get it, not people that are definitely going to. 
and I hope this is something that they do improve upon because I am looking forward to what they're going to make next because if they can figure out a way to improve upon old CRPG mechanics, they'll be a lot more successful. Thanks for watching.